places that ethoxide can pull a hydrogen off, as I said, we can pull it off from the one position, but we can also pull a hydrogen, or more specifically a proton, off from the three position. So let me represent that as well. Here's one of the two hydrogens at the three position. Here's our ethoxide. And in a very similar way, electrons flow from the ethoxide to the proton. We push electrons between the two carbons, and we kick out bromide. is whether we have the substituents on opposite sides of the double bond or whether we have the substituents on the same side of the double bond. So if they're on opposite sides, we refer to it as the trans isomer. And if they're on the same side, we refer to it as the cis isomer. So what's going on here? Let's talk about our substitution and the fact that we're forming four times as much of the two butene as we are of the 1-butene. So more substituted alkenes are more thermodynamically stable. Let me write this down. Halfway or partway, I should say, 
between the reactant and the product. That means we've started to form a double bond, we've started to break a bond between carbon and the proton, we've started to break a bond between carbon and bromine, we've started to form a bond between the ethoxide and the proton. So at the transition state, you're going to be feeling the greater stability in the choice for going for the two-butene <coughs> stereoisomer, and that's going to translate to a lower energy transition state, an easier path to take. So let me jot this down. So this greater stability is reflected in the transition state. of structure and bonding. Phenomenologically, this was observed by a Russian chemist, the greater preference for formation of an alkene, was observed by a Russian chemist and reported in, in 1875. His name was Zaitsev. So you'll read in your textbook about Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule is just a fancy way of saying that the more substituted alkene product tends to form in greater amount. Two butene forms more than one butene in this reaction. All right, let me amplify on what I was talking about with transition states and see if we can make a diagram that reflects what I just said on that blackboard about the greater stability of the transition state leading to the 2 butene. So let's imagine we think about an energy diagram, and I'll just draw, draw a diagram like we've done in the past, where on our y-axis, we have energy, and on our x-axis we have the reaction coordinate, that progression from reactants to products. And I'll put our reactant somewhere up here. We know that the reaction goes. In other words, it's downhill energetically. So I'll put our product here. More specifically, then, I'll put our 2-bromobutane and our ethoxide on the left. And on the right, let's start by worrying about the formation of 1-butene. So I'll put our 1-butene over here, an ethanol and bromide, of course, are the other products. And so we can think about a diagram. Remember, the E2 reaction is a concerted reaction. We don't form any intermediate, just like an SN2 reaction. It's a bimolecular reaction where two reactants come together, collide, go over an energy barrier, give rise to products without the formation of any intermediate. And so we can think about, think about it like so. Here's our transition state. Now, 2-butene, as I said, is more stable. There's a slight difference in stability between the cis and the trans. I'm not going to worry about it right now. I'll just draw out one stereoisomer. So it's going to be lower in energy. Everything else is equal. We have ethanol, we have bromide in both cases. We have two different <coughs> isomers. We're forming a more thermodynamically stable isomer. 
If I want to make a transition state diagram, if I want to make an energy diagram for the formation of 2-butene, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. And you can see almost intuitively, if I'm trying to connect to a lower point, almost intuitively, I'm going to have a lower energy barrier.
is more important, which substituent is the higher priority substituent. We learned rules about higher priority substituents. The higher priority substituent is a substituent first and foremost for the higher atomic number. We did this in RNS stereochemistry, in Conningold, Freilog stereochemistry. And then if you have to, you start to look at the substituents one over in branching. But here it's easy. We have a carbon and a hydrogen. Carbon's a higher atomic number, so we have a higher priority substituent here. And then over here, a carbon and a higher and a hydrogen, higher priority substituent here. Here, the higher priority substituents are on opposite sides. Of the double bond. By that I mean this one is on this side, this methyl is on this side. Since they're on opposite sides, we say this is a trans isomer, or more specifically, in this case, trans 2 butene. Now, normally we use trans when one of the substituents is a hydrogen on each side, in the case of a disubstituted alkene. There's a more general way that people express this for even tri-substituted and tetra-substituted alkenes. And that's to use a German term, E or entgegen, which means on opposite sides. So another perfectly acceptable name for this is E to butene. It's the more general name. But generally, when talking about disubstituted alkenes, two different substituents on the double bond, people will talk about cis and trans. And of course, by disubstituted, I mean disubstituted on opposite sides. If we had um, isobutylene, for example, we wouldn't be talking about it the same way. There's no cis and trans here because we have two hydrogens here. So you can't say, oh, it's one side or the other. Whereas here we have to say, all right, our methyls are on opposite sides. And then by comparison, we have the cis stereoisomer. And here we look at this, we say, all right, we're going to look at one side. And we say methyl is higher priority than hydrogen. Other side, methyl is higher priority than hydrogen. The two methyl groups are on the same side of the double bond. So this is a cis stereoisomer, <coughs> the cis to butene. And again, the more generic, the more general, I should say, descriptor that works with tri and tetra substituted alkenes as well is the German Z, which stands for zusammen or together. So this compound can also be called Z. So here I'd say for cis or Z higher priority substituents on same side. coming out, or I can draw it flat like this. But this is trigonal planar. 
This carbon is transplanar, and both planes are coplanar with each other. So, so the substituents and the double bond together constitute a plane in algae. Is that, is that what you were asking? Or, okay. Other questions? Really, that was a really important question because it's easy to lose sight of. Now, the big difference between carbon-carbon double bonds and carbon single bond, carbon single bonds is carbon-carbon double bonds are locked. You can't rotate about the carbon-carbon double bond. The pi bond involves two overlapping p orbitals. If you wanted to rotate about that central carbon-carbon double bond, you would have to remove the overlap between the p orbitals. That process is very high in energy because you have to break the double bond. The double bond is about 60 or 65 kilocalories per mole in energy. You can't get that much energy from heat. You would need a, a very energetic photon, for example, UV, very deep UV light to do it. So alkenes are locked in their conformation, but alkanes rotate freely about single bonds. The energetic barrier to rotation about the carbon-carbon bond is in ethane is three kilocalories per mole. That energy is overcome thermally very easily. The energetic barrier for having two methyl groups in, but in butene rotate in butane rotate past each other is about five or six kilocalories per mole. That energetic barrier is overcome very easily. And the energetic barrier to a ring flip in cyclohexane is about 10 kilocalories per mole, and even that energy is overcome very easily at room temperature. So energies of 10 or even 20 kilocalories per mole get overcome at room temperature. Reaction energies, activation energies up to 25 or 30 kilocalories per mole get overcome. But it's an exponential relationship between energy and rate. So by the time you're up to 60 kilocalories per mole, nothing, nothing happens. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the stereochemical course of elimination reactions. And if I have a chance, I want to show you something really cool at the end with acyclic stereochemistry. But I'm going to start with something a little easier with cyclic stereochemistry. All right, so there are some very strict stereochemical requirements for E2 elimination reactions. Reaction. 
Remember, in an SN2 reaction, our nucleophiles are going to come in directly backside of the carbon and cause the bromine to leave as bromide, taking its pair of electrons. In an elimination reaction, our base is pulling off a proton on the adjacent carbon, but our electron density is effectively coming in backside. We're actually putting electron density into the carbon-bromine sigma star orbital that's break and thus breaking the carbon-bromine bond. So, in other words, the bonds are going to line up in an anti-periplanar fashion. If I were to draw a Newman projection, what we would see is that in the reactive state, here's our bromine, here's our hydrogen, and I'll fill this out just by showing lines because I haven't specified our, our substituents. And our ethoxide <coughs> is coming in, we're pulling off the proton and we're kicking out the bromine. So the opposite of anti-elimination is sin-elimination. And it's not absolutely impossible for the hydrogen and the bromine to come in on, on the same side. It's not absolutely impossible for it to occur, but it's much more difficult. So sin elimination is not absolutely ruled out, but it's much more difficult. In the discussion problems this week, I've given an example of sin elimination, but it's a very special example where it's occurring in an intramolecular fashion, where for all intents and purposes, the base that pulls off the proton is built into the molecule. But when you don't have the base built into the molecule, when you have it occurring in an intermolecular fashion, there's a very, very strong preference for anti-elimination to occur. Let me show you some of the implications of this in a couple of examples. involves two stereoisomers of four tert-butyl, one of one bromo four tert-butyl cyclohexane. So let us take the stereoisomer in which the bromine and the tert-butyl group are cis to each other, and let's take the stereoisomer in which the bromine and the Tert-butyl group are trans to each other. In other words, in the top stereoisomer, the bromine is on the same face of the cyclohexane ring as the tert-butyl group. And in the other stereoisomer, the bromine, the trans stereoisomer, the bromine and the tert-butyl group are on opposite faces. Now remember, tert-butyl group is very special. It's going to, and the reason that chemists use it in studying reactions is it really, really wants to exist in the equatorial position. So there's a real specialness to it. All right, when we treat our first stereoisomer, our cis stereoisomer, with potassium tert-butoxide, Tert-butanol, 
we get E2 elimination quite rapidly to give the alkene, to give 4 terbutyl one cyclohexene On the other hand, when we subject our trans stereoisomer to the same conditions, potassium terbutoxide in terbutanol, the reaction occurs only very slowly. I'll write elimination very slow. Only about 1 500th the rate. So in one case, you mix them, you see elimination. In the other case, you mix them, you see very little elimination. And you have to heat it and beat on it to make it go. What's the big difference? In the first case, the stable conformation of the molecule has our terbutyl group, equatorial. The bromine's on the same face of the double bond, of the ring. So the bromine is axial. Well, look at our adjacent, our adjacent carbon, our beta carbon. Our beta carbon has a hydrogen on it that's anti-periplanar. So we have an anti-periplanar relationship here. It's very easy for the ethoxide to come in, pull off the proton, push the electron density in to form a double bond, and kick out electrons <coughs> onto the bromine to give bromide. You look at the cis stereoisomer, you look at the trans stereoisomer, and again, the turf butyl group wants to be equatorial. Now, the bromine can be equatorial, that's a little bit more thermodynamically stable, but on the other hand, there are no hydrogens that are anti. You have one hydrogen that's, that's gauche and one, another hydrogen that's gauche, but you have no anti-periplanar relationship. As a result, it's very hard to pull off that beta proton and to do an E2 elimination. Thoughts or questions? Another example, and I want us to now look at an acyclic example rather than a cyclic example. This is going to be a little bit harder to see because we're going to have to be vision, visualizing some molecules that have flexible chains in them where you can rotate about single bonds rather than rings where it's very easy to see some stereochemical relationships. But this one is also very cool. with two different stereoisomers of 1,2-dibromo, 1,2-diphenyl ethane. So I'm going to start with the chiral stereoisomer. I'll draw out the 1S, 2S stereoisomer of this chiral compound. I could also draw out the 1R, 2R stereoisomer. And we're going to see if we treat this stereoisomer 
with potassium terbutoxide and terbutanol. Just like in the other examples we've looked at today, taking a secondary alkyl halide with a strong base like ethoxide or terbutoxide leads to an E2 elimination reaction. What's interesting about this E2 elimination reaction is we get a single stereoisomer of the alkene and that stereoisomer has the E geometry, uh, the Z geometry. So the stereoisomer we have here is Z1-bromo-1,2-diphenylethane. Uh, it's C stereochemistry because on this side of the double bond, we have a phenyl group. Remember, a phenyl group is a ring of six carbon atoms with alternating double and single bonds. So we have a carbon at this position. And at this position, although I haven't drawn it, we have a hydrogen. So carbon is higher priority. On this side, we have a bromine and a carbon. Bromine is higher priority. So bromine and carbon are on the same side. So we say that this is the Z stereoisomer. Now, I want to contrast this with what happens if we take the diastereomer of 1,2-dibromo-diphenylethane. So I'm going to draw out the mesodiastereomer. <coughs> and we're going to treat the mesodiastereomer with potassium terbutoxide and terbutanol. One sec. Ah, thank you. Ethene. Z1-bromo-1,2-diphenylethene, E and E, because we have the double bond. Thank you. And now we generate the other alkane, alkene diastereomer. So now, instead of ending up with the, e pro the Z product, we end up with the E product. And just for the sake of being complete, I'm going to draw in the hydrogens here because we're going to see, see their fates in just a moment. So this is the this is the E 1 bromo 1 2 diphenyl ethene. Now, the easiest way, I think, to see the stereochemical course of this acyclic <coughs> reaction is to draw a Newman projection 
and to look at the relationships of the hydrogens and the bromines. So I'm going to take the molecule on top, and I'm going to imagine picking it up and bringing it over like this. Let me show you again. The two bromines are pointing out. There's a phenyl group and a phenyl group. The bromines are pointing out. I'm going to pick it up and make a Newman projection. Can you see in your mind's eye what I just did? Here is the molecule. The bromines are coming out at us. One phenyl is up here, one phenyl is down here. I've picked it up just like we've done in our discussion of visualizing stereochemistry. Brought it over here. Here's the phenyl that was on the top right. Here's the phenyl that was on the bottom left and the two bromines are pointing over here. Now look how we're set up. In this rotomer, we're set up with a hydrogen that's opposite to a bromine, and another hydrogen that's opposite to a bromine. And I can do this with either hydrogen, it doesn't matter. I'll just have the ethoxide pull off this one. You'll get the same result if you pull off the other one. So we're going to pull off that proton, push in electron density, kick out bromine, and go to the alkene. And I'll draw a Newman projection of the alkene. We now have our phenyl group on front and our bromine on front. And then on back, we have a phenyl group, and remember when things directly overlap, you offset them just a little bit in making your Newman projection drawing. And here we have a hydrogen. So do you notice now if I just take this up and pick it up, pick it back up, here we have the product that I've drawn on top. In other words, this requirement for an anti-elimination gives rise to the stereoisomer that I've shown over on top, the Z stereoisomer. the exact same operation with the drawing of the meso compound. I'm going to take this molecule, pick it up, bring it over to a Newman projection. So we had a phenyl group here, a phenyl group here, a bromine on what's going to become the front carbon coming out at us, and a bromine on the back carbon going back. <coughs> So this is a Newman projection of the molecule as I've drawn it on the bottom center board. Now, in this particular rotomer, there's no anti-peri planar relationship. This hydrogen is opposite to that hydrogen, and there's no anti-peri planar relationship between a hydrogen and a bromine. This hydrogen is opposite to that hydrogen. The two bromines are opposite to each other. But not a problem. As I said before, rotation about carbon-carbon single bonds occurs quite readily. And so we rotate through all different rotomers. You have a dynamic equilibrium. I'll just draw one other rotomer. I'll rotate the back side of the molecule. And so I will draw a rotomer. We'll just, we'll just picture rotating counterclockwise about the back carbon. That's going to put the phenyl up here, the bromine here, and the hydrogen down here. 
In this rotamer, we do have an anti-periplanar relationship between a bromine and a hydrogen. This hydrogen is anti-periplanar to this bromine. Ethoxide base can come in, pull off that proton, kick in electron density to form a double bond, and give rise and kick out bromine, and this gives rise to this product. Now the two phenyls are on opposite, are on the same side of the double bond, and this phenyl is opposite to bromine. In other words, I can just draw this molecule. Flat, pH, pH, bromine, hydrogen, and you'll notice that we have the E stereoisomer. So the requirement for an antiperiplanar elimination has led to the Z stereoisomer in the case of the first diastereomer of dibromo diphenylethane, and the E stereoisomer in the case of the second. In our final class, we'll pick up and we'll talk about E1 eliminations and conditions under which they occur.